Hi Liam, thanks for joining us today and also your participation in the webinar we host, hosted in February on suicide ideation in primary school aged children. Thanks for having me. So this is a chance um, to really get your reflections now we're a few months after the webinar and did you have any key takeaways from the discussion? Yeah, there are a couple of things I've been thinking about since then. I mean, one of the biggest things was the, the level of interest. So it was a really popular, one of MHPN's most popular webinars, yeah. which was great. And that, that didn't really surprise me, I suppose, but I felt relieved that people were taking it seriously. So for a while now, I've been thinking about children and suicide and, and that kind of began over 10 years ago when I was working in schools. So I've been reading and writing and doing some, some sort of research around it. and. Um, had felt concerned and then felt concerned that why aren't people worrying about this? We're hearing a lot about suicide at the moment, we hear a lot about youth suicide and, and various groups at risk, but we don't hear about children. So I, I felt relieved that people are joining me in this concern, which was, was, was great. The other thing I've thought about quite a lot was people anxiety around it and so people feeling like they don't know what to do so this feeling like it's something different to what I normally do I'm not necessarily able to deal with that and that came through in some of the questions on the night but also some of the questions leading up to the registration process in the webinar and something I hear about in, in other work that I do around this topic as well so so that um, I guess got me thinking about what else do we need to do and I've been writing and, and doing some other other work as well so one of the things I did as a direct result from the, the webinar was to write an article for um, this edition of the Australian Psychological Society Insight so it was an edition that I, I really was was prompted to do because of the response felt like I wanted to follow up so that's an article that's available online to people. Oh great and we'll put a link to that um, yeah, in the good. article alongside so yeah. folks that are watching this can can check that out. Yeah great. Well. We do have some questions that the participants provided in the exit survey, and I'll get to those in a moment, but one of the key takeaways um, from the webinar, overwhelmingly participants mentioned, was around collaborative approach and using you know, a multidisciplinary team to identify protective fa factors, work closely with family members, and the importance of taking the time to explain suicide risk, the assessment, goals, and referral pathways. There's a lot there. Lynn. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot. And yeah. as with all of MHPN webinars, we, these are the sorts of issues that come up all the time. So the importance of working collaboratively and the benefit, mm. and we see that in the panel, we see the benefit of different perspectives and different disciplines having different ways of working or sometimes some different ways of thinking about, about what we're doing. So um, doing this work, you can't do it on your own, really. So people watching, if, if you're sort of thinking about what the work is, if you're working in a school, you've, you've obviously got people around you, but they won't all necessarily be on the same page. Age. And if you're working in private practice, you really need to think about well, who, are, who are the people that I can consult with, who are the people that I can be with, what are the pathways, what are those referral pathways if I am concerned, how do I, how do I sort of make some decisions around where to refer people so that I'm not sitting with this on my own is, is really important. And of course parents, so my focus in, in the webinar was very much around the role of parents. When we're talking about young primary school age kids, we can't think about them without thinking about, about parents. So that was a big focus for me in the webinar and something that I'm really continuing to be interested in and doing some more writing about as well. Yeah, great. Thanks, Lynn. And there's a link to the recording um, on MHPN's website as well. Um, we had a few questions um, for the, from the participants um, in the exit survey, so things they were sort of still reflecting on after the discussion. Mm. And one of them, one of the participants asked about child protection and how much they should be involved. Yeah, I think the, the, I think the question that came up was maybe assuming that if there's child who's suicidal that child protection is automatically needed. Um, to be a report made to child protection and, and I think we need to think about them as two different things. So if a child discloses something as part of the conversation, of which suicide is part of it, and child protection, your normal concerns and belief that you need to form a, a formed, well then you contact child protection as part of that. But suicidality on its own doesn't necessarily warrant a child protection report. So I, I think it's important to distinguish those two things. We do know that one of the biggest risk factors for children in relation to suicide is, is a child abuse and, and you know, parent issues with parents. So, so it may well be the case that a child protection report is required, but that shouldn't be our starting point. We shouldn't start with that. We need, we need to work through what's actually happening and go through a process of understanding what's happening. And then if we find that there's something of concern in relation to child protection, we then use our usual process. But the suicidality in itself is not, is not its own issue. Mm, mm. Okay, and someone else asked about 
um, how about the assessment of risk was their question. Yeah. yeah, the assessment of risk of suicide is a really big one and people really struggle with it, I think, not just in children, but a whole, across the whole board. So we've had, over the years, we've had a lot of um, concern around how do we actually predict risk and we know that we can't for a whole lot of reasons, we can't actually predict risk, but as mental health practitioners we we need to have something that helps us to feel like we've got the information and that we can feel confident if we're letting that person leave us that they're going to be confident we're going to be confident and so a tool can help us sometimes do that but it can actually be a very false sense of confidence so it may not actually be accurate and we, we know that from decades of work around that so the suicide risk assessment is much more these days around planning understanding the needs of, of the child and planning and safety planning is, is what we're really needing to focus on so understanding listening what's going on for them and how can we help them resolve some of the issues that are happening and then keep them some work on the safety planning around that which will obviously include parents and teachers in schools as well so that's that's the focus rather than getting low or medium or high risk is, is not helpful at all um, but I know it's out there people are still looking at that people still have policies that talk about that so we have to really keep working on helping people understand the formulation of risk and the safety planning that comes with that yes so you mentioned tools for practitioners. So, and another um, participant asked, are there any specific therapeutic interventions and how do we manage these when there are limited services available? Yeah, and this is always an issue as well in terms of what, what do we do? You know, we find out that there's a concern around suicide. What's, what's our next step? Mm -hmm. And of course, with something like suicide for children particularly, it's really understanding what's going on for them. And it's often things that are happening in the family or within schools or with friendships. So if we sort of understand suicide and talking about suicide or acting around suicide is a, is a way of communicating some distress, that telling us that something is not right or there's something that's worrying a child. Well, rather than thinking about what's our therapeutic approach, to that our best thing is to listen take it seriously and then work with the child to understand what's actually happening for them so what's underneath this what why is this happening now why why are we talking about suicide at this point in time and sometimes if, if we can work out what that is well then we we can resolve that we work with the child and work with people to to resolve the actual issue so then the, the talk about suicide naturally kind of dissipates or, or isn't needed anymore. Sometimes it can be part, however, of, of an emerging mental health issue that may not have been picked up or a, a neurological issue like ADHD or autism spectrum disorder. So it, it can be part of something else. And so again, that's where it warrants further assessment beyond the suicidality itself, but normal sort of mental health assessment. And then there might be some um, therapeutic treatments um, to do with that. So it's working out what's, what's underneath it. What's the meaning of the suicide talk or risk at the moment? Mm, mm. So another participant asked, do the majority of these young children overtly express their suicide ideation, suicidal ideation, or is there a substantial group that don't express themselves? So is the first recognition only after they have acted to self-harm? It might be, and this, this is the trouble that we have with suicide for, across the board, but particularly for children. We, we have very little research around children and suicide. It's, it's a very difficult topic to, to do research on. Children are often not included in research for a whole lot of ethical reasons and other reasons. So a lot of it we don't actually know. I, I think it's um, concerning to think that if we don't sort of know the risk and we're not aware of it, then children could be trying to tell us. And this is what we know from the Kids Helpline research, that children were trying to tell adults around them, parents and teachers and other adults are in contact with, and weren't being heard. So I think my interest in this topic is to try and raise that awareness so that adults are actually ready to hear and open to hearing so that we can see the signs and we do take it seriously so that we don't actually get children having to escalate and, and then act on that before people then start to say, oh, they, they were serious. So I think even with adults, it's very difficult. People don't always tell and share their intent and we, we know that from research that has been conducted. We know people go to GPs and don't, don't always share their suicidal feelings or thoughts or even actions. So even for adults, it can be very difficult for them to, to tell and to share what they're actually thinking and feeling. And we know from adults that sometimes they have thoughts of suicide that began in childhood that they've carried with them and they've, they've been a constant part of, of their way of coping or their way of thinking about, about problems and about life. So we need to keep opening the doors, I think, and being aware and ready, ready to hear and then knowing what to do if we do hear to take it seriously. So we'll link to the Kids Helpline research. Thanks for mentioning that, Lynn. And there's obviously a lot that got discussed on the night of the webinar. And you know, we can see from the practitioner comments that you know they're really engaged in the conversation. Um, another participant asked, 
you know, do you manage the case of a child that repeatedly brings up suicide and the parents um, feel like the child is just being attention seeking? Yeah, I hear that a lot and it, it really bothers me that, that we can dismiss that as attention seeking. And I know one of the comments that after the webinar that I read through later was someone um, talking about working in school and being really frustrated by that and, and people hearing it but not really taking it seriously and, and that attention seeking idea that they're just saying it, they just want attention. So for me, it's if a child's continuing to talk about it, it's telling us that they want to hear something and it may be you know, distressed or it may be something is bothering them and so they're trying to tell us and communicate with us so the more we don't take it seriously the more they can escalate that which can place them at greater risk and I think if we are thinking about a child or anyone talking about suicide as attention seeking I think we need to think about that what is it that they're needing to get our attention and why isn't that being met in in other ways so I think we've got to be very careful about that and I do hope that people looking at the, the kids helpline research will see that this is this is quite serious and there are people that will adults as well who do have chronic suicidality who, who do just keep talking about it it's very difficult to work with that but they certainly need need additional support and that is something that, that psychologists and other mental health practitioners do do help people to to work with but even then even if people it's very common for people you're looking for changes in that so you're looking at if that kind of escalates or if there's a change in that because it can they can still be at risk even if they're talking about it, it seems quite normal so we do need to take it seriously particularly in children because mm. there's there's a lot of um, concern if they're talking about that to other children that can be concerning it, it becomes part of who they are it becomes a, a, a kind of a way of talking about feelings when we should be helping them open up their conversation and open up and find other ways of expressing themselves as well and, and not impacting on other kids too yeah so was there anything um, that you didn't get to share on the night, Lynn, of the webinar? There was... Yeah, there's always lots yeah. more. <laughs> the, the time goes really, really quickly and you feel like you've got a lot of information, but there's always more to, to share and more that comes up. I, I think there are a couple of things. One of the um, areas, I guess, that for me is, and children is around teachers and schools being aware and, and certainly even when I worked as a school psychologist which was over 10 years ago when I was working in schools it was starting to emerge then and I remember in primary schools people being really concerned and not not really ready for that it was something that they thought older kids would talk about so it was often quite difficult for, for teachers to hear that and of course teachers aren't trained in mental health they're, they're part of it and they're a very important part of um, mental health and well-being of children but it can be very difficult for mental health practitioners who have some training to, to deal with children who who are um, or respond effectively and be sensitive to children who are who are suicidal or talking about suicide. For, so for teachers, it's even harder. So I think that helping teachers and supporting teachers is something that we need to do more of. And I, I know there's initiatives like BU um, who, that are out there to help teachers to, to keep working through this and have it as part of their their overall um, work that they do. Um, but I, I do think in terms of suicide risk, it is really important to, to make sure that we are supporting teachers who are hearing this and exposed to this. It can be really confronting and difficult to hear. Mm. And the other part of that is self-care for all of the adults and, and workers who are working with, with um, children and families at risk of suicide. And I, I do some consultation with people um, in relation to suicide risk and you can see the impact on people it really the, the weight of it sits with people and often mental health practitioners haven't had specific training in, in suicide and there's various courses and things that are that are there professional development events and, and things like the webinar but sitting with it is really hard and again that self-care that that ability to feel like you've done as much as you can that you've had support and that you're actually able to look after yourself and that you're using this as a chance to reflect on what you can do and the, the capacity that people have to get through difficult times I think is really important as well so that notion of self-care and sitting with with what this means I, I think it's a really important one and, and helping people to find opportunities to do that yeah and that's really important with um, it's it's suicide prevention day today and are you okay day is, is coming up so having you know keeping an eye on your colleagues yeah. and those in the community and you mentioned mm. teachers are such an important part of the conversation as well yeah well given it is World Suicide Prevention Day what's your advice to practitioners yeah, the, the theme this year is shine a light on suicide prevention. So I guess that's what we did. This webinar <laughs> did, did get a shining a light on, yeah. on children and the risk of suicide. So I think that self-care message, I think continuing to find out about it. So engaging in conversations about it. I, I think trying to understand it as part of the work that we do. It's not something that you come across and then you have to refer out. There's a lot of things that people can do through their listening skills, through their, their basic 
core skills as a health practitioner that you can do that will be really helpful because if you don't have that in place, all the strategies and all the, all the um, tools in the world aren't going to make a difference. So trust in yourself, get support in yourself and look after yourself, but engage and, and, and keep learning about it, I think is really important. Great advice, Lynn. And um, we hear that you attended a conference recently, or perhaps a couple of conferences. You've been I have. busy. <laughs> I have been pretty busy. So since since the webinar, I've, I've been to a couple of conferences. I went to the Suicide Prevention Australia conference, and I did present about this topic. I just had a 15 minute slot and in the audience were the researchers from Boys Town who did the Kids Helpline. So they came up to me, that research, they came up to me afterwards and, and said that they were very pleased that I'd shared that. So I think they're happy with what I shared. I don't think I misrepresented it too badly. So that was a nice connection to make. So that was great. And then I did a workshop at the 20th International Mental Health um, Conference, which was up on the Gold Coast, which was very nice. It, um, at the um, golf resort up there. Not that I got outside very often, but it was it was nice to be there. And I had a workshop, and it was an hour and a half workshop, and that was really popular. I had we were turning people away at the door, so we had capacity in the room for about seventy five people, and people were lining up the door. So I know the interest is there, which mm. is which is fabulous. And I'm heading off to the. Um, Congress, the 30th International Congress in um, Derry, Northern Ireland, in, um, for for that period of time in September as well. So I'll be heading heading off there, Great. and I've got a poster about this topic as well. Excellent. Well, hopefully a bit of self care time in yes, you as well. Yes, we a holiday. <laughs> That sounds great. And um, we also hear that you've got a book coming out. Yes. So I spent last year writing a book for parents. So it was built on, in many ways, it's it's my life's work. So the work that I've done with parents, work I've done with communities, and then my more recent focus, explicit focus on suicidology. So I've pulled all that together. And it's a, parent, a book for parents of teenagers called Keeping Our Kids Alive, Parenting Suicidal Teenagers. So that's going to be coming out. It's going to be published by Australian Academic Press. And it's with the copy editor, apparently. So fixing up all of my little typos and grammatical errors that, are, that there's a few of, um, and it should be out later in the year. And I'm working on a similar version for parents of younger children now, so that's my little project oh, at the moment. Well, great. So hopefully that'll come out next yeah. year. Yeah, and one for practitioners to look out for. Yes, that's fantastic. yes, hope it's useful. Yeah, well, thank you so much for your time today, Lena. It was just great to reflect and um, hear your thoughts post-webinar, and also just get your thoughts on some of the practitioner questions. So. Yeah. I hope that some of the practitioners that we answered their questions, hopefully they're watching this along today. Um, well, we can announce that next year, early 2020, we're looking at um, continuing this discussion. Um, and MHPN are pleased to announce that we'll be hosting a webinar focused on suicide risk assessment, which you're yeah. going to be a part of, Lynn. You're Good helping topic. us develop. Yes. Yes, looking forward to that. So thank you. It'll be another interdisciplinary panel discussion. So look out for that and um, check out mhpn.org.au for all of the details and keep up with our upcoming webinars and of course our practitioner networks. But thanks again, Lynn. Great thank to you. chat with you today. Yeah, great to be here. Thanks. thanks.